economy. So we've heard a lot about the care economy, how it matters. So we're going to have a chance to to listen to uh, some of the work that we're doing in that. We have three presentations and a number of discussions, so we will make effective use of our time. So without further ado, I will give the floor to the first presenter, Caroline. So I'll go right ahead and begin by introducing myself briefly. I'm Caroline Kabiru with African Population and Health Research Centre in Nairobi. And we're collaborating with um, McGill University on this project. And Frank Grimaud will also be presenting. Um, and for us, we're really interested in creating better economic opportunities for women um, in slums in Nairobi um, through improved childcare options. Um, and. Um, from the Kenya Demographic, uh, Seville, um, Kenya Demographic and Health Survey, we do know that about half of women aged 15 to 49 in Kenya have a child between the ages of zero and five, so younger than five. And we're interested in assessing whether daycare could be the missing link uh, to women's economic empowerment, uh, because we know there have been significant investments in primary and secondary school education, uh, but the challenges around finding suitable uh, childcare options, could that be an impediment uh, uh, to women's economic empowerment? So in our project, we are assessing whether uh, subsidized uh, and enhanced quality daycare can influence a woman's ability to work and earn. Um, and our target sample is women uh, of reproductive age, that's 15 to 49 years of age, with at least one child between the ages of one and three. So any child um, who's younger than four years, but older than a year. And part of that uh, decision is also informed by uh, programming around exclusive breastfeeding and whether women are, are really comfortable having a child younger than one uh, attending a daycare. And we're conducting our research in Korogosho, which is an informal settlement in Nairobi, um, highly densely populated, characterized by poor housing um, conditions, um, a lot of the people are, uh, are employed in the informal sector. Um, and then there are lots of other challenges, environmental challenges, in insecurity, and some of that has featured in some of the qualitative work that we've done with women. Um, we have four uh, research questions that we are uh, seeking to answer. The first is, what childcare arrangements are currently used by women? Um, and for that, uh, we have done a baseline survey, and I'll speak a little bit about that. Uh, but we've also done some um, photo voice sessions where we ask women to go out with a camera and um, speak about um, and document some of the challenges that they face in terms of balancing childcare and work. Um, the second question we ask is how does affordability and quality of daycare services affect enrollment? Um, so if you give women um, subsidized daycare, uh, do they uptake enrollment, um, do they uptake um, daycare use? But in addition, if you enhance the quality of daycare, might that have um, an additional effect? The third question we're asking is, does expanding women's childcare option increase their labor force participation, whether or not they're working, the number of hours worked, and their household income? And the final question that we're asking is, what is the economic impact for the most disadvantaged women? So looking at single mothers uh, versus those who are married, and then migrants versus long stairs in the so we are taking a mixed method approach, um, and um, we've done some formative um, community sensitization meetings and a daycare inventory. And part of that work has shaped um, the nature of our intervention. When we wrote our proposal, our, um, um, our idea around improving the quality of childcare options was to uh, provide, select some daycares and um, provide them with uh, access to people who have been trained. So situate people who've been trained in some of these daycares and then uh, sort of pay for that service. Uh, but then in discussions with the community, uh, uh, during the community sensitization meeting, um, the feedback that we got was that 
yes, it would be great to have those trained teachers, but when you leave the project, what happens? Uh, we'd like something that's sustainable. So in terms of our design of the intervention, we changed it based on that, and what you'll hear a little bit more about what the intervention looks like now. Um, then we conducted, we randomly sampled um, some women in the, uh, in the area, and I'll just step back and say that the APHRC has been running a demographic surveillance site in Korogosho since 2002, where we follow up the po uh, a population over time. And so we do have a database where we are able to randomly um, um, select uh, women with a child before, below the ages of four, and we ask them, where do you take, what uh, childcare options are you using? And uh, through that, we were able to identify a list of daycares where uh, women were taking their children to, and those were the uh, daycares that we used for our intervention. Um, we've also had a, a little bit of stakeholder in, uh, engagement in terms of um, stakeholder meetings and one-on-one -on -one meetings that has also shaped um, some of the things that we're doing. And the stakeholders are drawn from both government, uh, the non-governmental organization. A lot of them are focusing on um, early childhood development and universities, including um, one of the uh, um, grantees of uh, GROW, who's also based in Nairobi. Um, we've, as I mentioned, we did some uh, qualitative work, um, and that was the photo voice methodology, and I'll, I'll come back to that, so I won't uh, speak too much about that. Um, and then we had focus group discussions, which built on the photo voice um, discussions. So the women go out, they take the photos, they provide captions for that, but then they also share their thoughts um, in a focus group discussion where you bring in community leaders um, and other stakeholders within the community. And then we did a baseline survey um, with uh, 1,223 mothers. Um, following the baseline survey, um, which was done in September uh, and uh, October of last year, we began our intervention. And I'll speak a little bit uh, about that in a bit. And then we had, uh, we're currently just finishing our end line uh, survey um, this week, uh, hopefully. And throughout the process of uh, the um, intervention, we have been regularly monitoring uh, the use of vouchers, and we've actually engaged people from the county office that's in charge of assessing this, who are participating in our process, uh, in the monitoring evaluation process, so that they can check on some of the learnings from the training, which was part of our intervention. And then we've also done some in-depth interviews with mothers who participated in the study, and we had the second round of photo voice, um, to assess how access to the voucher has impacted on their uh, child, um, their, their having to balance work and uh, childcare. And we've, as, um, as before, following uh, the photo voice, they also had some focus group discussions and then some interviews with key stakeholders. So in terms of our, our design, uh, as I mentioned, we did a baseline survey with over a thousand uh, women. Um, and initially we had thought that, okay, very few women would be using uh, childcare anyway, so we were to randomly assign women to either uh, receive a voucher for regular daycare, vouchers for enhanced daycare, and then a control group that would receive uh, nothing. But what we found out is a third of the women were actually using, paid for um, childcare. So we changed our design, and instead what we did was, was that from the inventory that we had, and we did uh, find a few more uh, new daycares during the baseline survey, we then randomly assign the daycares first, and then for women who are not using uh, daycare, then they were randomly assigned uh, to one of the groups. And then, as I mentioned, we're doing our inline survey. In terms of the voucher only, you, the women receive a voucher uh, where we pay the fees for the daycare, uh, but we also do give a small stipend to the participating daycares um, in terms of monthly stipends, because we do understand that there's an increase, there may be an increased demand and uh, they need to cater for that. For the uh, quality improved, they received the 12 months of daycare, but in addition, we did provide them with material support and a week-long training workshop on uh, early childhood development that was facilitated by the Aga Khan Foundation in November of last year before the intervention began and then they had a refresher in May. So some selected findings from the photo voice, um, and um, I'll skip that. It's um, how does childcare affect your work, and what are some of the challenges and some solutions. For the second round of uh, um, photo voice, which I won't uh, present, is how 
uh, has your daily life or that of other family members changed since you joined uh, the voucher program? And I'll just uh, highlight one picture in the interest of time. Um, so here is a mother walking to, um, with her child um, on the streets in Korogosho. And the women actually provide the caption there. And they say, this mother has a child. She's going to look for a casual job. If you go to someone looking for a casual job with a child, no one is going to give you work. So here they were just trying to illustrate some of the challenges that women face in terms of uh, balancing child care um, and, um, uh, and work. And Frankel presents. Results. And as you see, we're actually now doing the second round. Yeah, yeah, well, that's all, all the fun stuff. <laughs> uh, what you'll see is our 1,200 or so mothers uh, are quite varied. The diversity for this age. some data
understanding. Okay, so just a uh, few comments. I'm sure you have taken care of uh, all of them. It's just not coming out very clearly from the material that um, I had. So one is, I really like your qualitative approach. It's very very um, But maybe a comment on how you are making sure that it's not limiting. Uh, so you mentioned in your if you could take care of. Then, um, <laughs> okay, is it better? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I was just to summarize, I was saying that qualitative approach was really structured and interesting, but maybe um, sometimes qualitative research becomes leading. So we have to make sure that, you know, respondents are not uh, getting led into that uh, um, problem or outcomes. Um, then second was um, the selection of slum that you did. Maybe a comment in your report on the external validity, like how um, is that slum represent or that sample representative of the uh, country or maybe that particular region or something, a comment would be great. Um, then you did the daycare inventory survey, but um, if you could mention how it helped in your sampling strategy, um, if it did, like if you used it uh, to identify those, uh, some 48 uh, daycare centers maybe, so how uh, did that help? And then, um, so as you mentioned, like 61% of women are already engaged in income generating activities and uh, like measuring outcomes there is going to be a little long term. So like how are you going to define it? Maybe this is something that we could discuss all through the next three days. Um, also, I saw that the daycare centers are different in terms of quality and what they are offering. Also mothers are um, in one of the material it was mentioned that mothers are selecting themselves, like mothers who are not using the service are selecting which daycare to go to. Also in those three buckets you have mothers who are using the facility and who are not using the facility. So how is it, like how will you segregate the outcomes um, like in each bucket would be really helpful um, to you know mention because currently uh, it's not coming out very well. Um, so given that you're collecting, just the last one, given that you're collecting a lot of qualitative information, um, I think uh, for policy makers, doing a heat map kind of a thing would be really, like it'll give, it'll have a visual appeal and it'll be easy for them to see instead of just the photographs. We have tried to do it in projects where we do community engagement and FGDs and all. And given you have all this data, maybe like putting it up in a heat map will be, um, you know, more visually effective. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it was great to read the, the materials of, uh, of this project. Um, I'm very impressed by the mixture of the methods, of methods that you are using. It's very interesting. And I'm very much looking forward for next year results. <laughs> the RCT is very promising, very interesting. Uh, as you can tell from the RCT, the randomized control trial, there are these two um, treatment arms, voucher for regular child care and voucher for an enhanced child care. And behind this, there is a theory of change. 
and I would like to, to ask you to, to emphasize it more on, on your documents. What's the theory of change that you have in mind for, 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 for this intervention? What's the rationale for the intervention? What's the status quo that the intervention is trying to change uh, to get a, a clearer picture in terms of formal and informal arrangements for childcare? And how is it that these informal and formal arrangements uh, fit women's needs? Actually, if two-thirds of women are already working, how is it that the equilibrium is set now? And what type of impacts do we expect f from this uh, intervention in terms of job quality, labor supply at the intensive margin, perhaps, not, not, more, not so much at the extensive, but at the intensive, earnings, and some other measures of well-being of, of individuals or, or mothers in this case, like stress, for instance, that that could be interesting. And to, to put this into a kind of framework where you want to put things clear, clear in terms of preferences and constraints will help to set up this theory of change. Um, it is implicit from, from the setting that a woman will have some preferences in terms of quality. But for ECD, quality is a very, very multidimensional concept. So what are the dimensions of this multidimensional concept that matter for these matters will be important? One of those elements of quality will be schedules. And schedules is, is particularly relevant for the job schedules that the female will have. So how is it that the preferences in some cases are actually endogenously determined by the labor schedules of the mothers and how do they play in terms of, of these centers. And in terms of constraints, there are basically two types of constraints. The time constraint linked to these preferences that I just outlined before and the uh, monetary constraint. And if, if, um, if the monetary constraint is binding in this case, then, then this type of RCT, this type of interventions with vouchers will, will play a role. Then I would like to see a discussion in terms of how do these numbers fit. For, for the few numbers that I managed to see, I didn't get a clearer picture of how constrained these females are to pay for this childcare. So these are basically my comments, and again, I'm looking forward for next year. Thanks. If, if you could have, yes, this slide. try to respond to some of the questions that Frank as well will um, input. Um, in terms of, uh, I'll begin with the first question about um, how do you ensure that women are not led? And it's, it's actually something that emerged um, even in our, in our second photo voice, where um, at first we had allowed some women who had in, uh, participated in the initial one to participate in the second one, where we're really interested in understanding um, how having access to the voucher has changed their lives and uh, their lives and the and the lives of uh, people in their households. And we noticed that when you do that, you actually have a, a change in sort of the pictures that they take because they're being influenced. So we did make a decision not to include any women who had in, uh, participated in the first photo voice um, uh, session so that we're really getting the, the stories uh, from those who did not participate, are not aware of what um, that group did. Um, because yes, it is a, a valid concern that uh, when you do give people a prompt, then they're actually um, in terms of the selection of the slum and to what extent this is representative of slum populations, um, the, the um, 
main basis for this is because we do have, we've been conduct, we run a demographic surveillance site um, in Korogosho, and there's another slum, uh, Viwandani. Um, and we were all, already doing another study, uh, which is looking at kinship support for single mothers in Korogosho. So it did make sense in that uh, way, because we have then a rich uh, source of data for, from which we can sample women. Um, in terms of how representative it is, um, we have done a Nairobi cross-sectional slum survey. We did one in 2000 and we did another one in 2012. And really in terms of indicators, there's a lot of similarities between what we see in Korogosho and what we see in other slums. Um, in terms of the daycare inventory, the, uh, the main purpose uh, of doing that was to understand, this was to really enable us to sample daycares. So we needed to know which daycares exist. Um, yes, we could walk around and identify, but it would be in, we thought it would be um, complimentary to ask, actually ask women, where do you take your child um, to daycare? And when they mentioned a uh, 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 um, daycare where they either paid or something, we actually went and tried to trace it. And we did find in some cases that it was sort of the same daycare that someone else had reported using a different name, because sometimes it's referred to as so-and-so's daycare, the person who owns it. So it was useful for us to understand what was available. And it was also useful because in terms of our randomization, we wanted to um, assign women to daycares that met a certain quality of standard because we're actually giving them vouchers. So this also allowed us to go in, see what services they're available, how long they're open, um, what sort of structures that they have, and then we could say, yes, this is a daycare that could participate in our, in our study. Um, in terms of um, the daycares are different, terms of services and we did make that conscious decision that we wanted to them to have a certain level of quality um, so yes they are different I'll follow up with you on the heat map um, because I'm not familiar with that um, in terms of um, the dimensions of quality that uh, the theory of change I think that's very good feedback and we'll share that with uh, our colleagues in terms of thinking more around the theory of change and making sure we emphasize and I especially like the a comment that you made about um, looking at the different dimensions of quality and how that might actually affect um, um, Thanks for the, the comments and taking the time to read that. Um, obviously, uh, to go back on the theory of change, uh, we, have we have some that are not See, the theory of change will have at least two different I think that, that, that that's a, it's very interesting as working as a group process. Uh, uh, not only on the McGill side, we have you know, key economists like myself, but we have sociologists, we have communication specialists, and political scientists. And, uh, just among ourselves, it's tough to actually discuss. When you think about going to uh, to Kenya, where uh, these guys are also health specialists, so it's very interesting because we're all learning from each other. So theory of change, unique theory of change. Is actually very uh, external validity, quite frankly, we don't care. It's a slum, we, and we really we're, we're thinking about that particular part. We're having a hard time enough to deal with it. In order to make the claims after that they will apply elsewhere, we're going to use different tools. But right now, we, we, we understand this. We have to pay more attention to all of it.
Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I am Paru Lagarwal and my colleague Anushaka is here with me. We represent IFMR LEAD, which is a research institution in India. And for this project, we are partnering with McGill University and Arijit and uh, Sam couldn't be here, but they are very excited to get any comments and feedback that we have uh, from this. So just to mention, we still have a year to go into the study, so any comments, thoughts, or outcomes that you think we should measure will be really, really helpful. We recently had our discussion with the advisory committee that we have set up, and it was really useful because we got a lot of interesting uh, comments. So please feel free to give us feedback or grill us on anything. It will be really helpful. Um, so, sorry. Yeah. So just to, um, we just have 15 minutes, so I'll take care of um, the first three uh, pointers, and then I'll pass it on to Anushaka to discuss the findings. Um, so just to set up a little context as to where we stand in terms of childcare and women empowerment in India, um, this, is, this is a study that was done by McKinsey on Female Empowerment Index, and you see that um, the, so our geography of the project is Rajasthan, which is in the western extreme. And the, you see that the um, index stands at 0.52, which is you know, somewhere in the middle between the highest and the lowest, but it's, uh, it's still a very poor indicator of women empowerment. Um, this is just a broad theory of change. I agree with the earlier presenter from McGill, it's very difficult to come up with a theory of change. We are still struggling with it. But there are, def so how we see it is um, the different participants or the different um, stakeholders that get impacted by the affordable childcare include children, uh, which includes pe uh, children who are going to these daycare centers, plus their siblings who um, otherwise would have taken care of them. Um, then we have mothers, uh, and then the households in general. So on the ch um, with respect to children, uh, there are lack of reliable, affordable childcare leads to poor nutrition and development outcomes for children. Uh, there is school dropout and illiteracy, especially in case of siblings who otherwise take care of these smaller children. And then there are issues related to early marriage and childbirth, which are very, very long term, uh, but it does happen. And then uh, in case of mothers, it leads to time poverty and psychological stress. Um, there is intimate partner violence, which is not directly related to childcare, but just because um, uh, the um, uh, opportunity to participate in labor force is less, their social network is limited, their um, social, economic, and you know, health empowerment indicators are poor. That's why it leads to um, you know, uh, intimate partner violence, and they do not really um, report it. And it also leads to lack of economic opportunity, low wages, household poverty, and then poor mental and physical health. Um, so we are trying to study all of these indicators in our detailed surveys, which take us around two and a half hours. But um, some of these, given that it's a three year long study, some of these we will be, I think, able to um, address in the medium term and some in the longer term, um, and some in maybe like after five years we'll be able to see these, but we'll know. Um, in terms of, so how we have put this up is that the, like we have tried to constrain ourselves as much as possible because it's a randomized control trial and it needs to be standardized. So our problem is uh, lack of affordable um, daycare centers in the geography um, um, of Rajasthan. And input or intervention is an affordable daycare center, which we call Balwadi. So I'll be using this term quite a lot, uh, but yeah, so just bear with me. Um, the immediate output that we see from the introduction or intervention of these daycare centers is better health status of children and change in mother's time allocation. Um, I'll discuss why we think these are the immediate outputs. Uh, outcomes are in terms of greater economic opportunity, opportunities for women, increased enrollment of children in the uh, formal schooling system because uh, they are habituated to the early child education in these daycare centers. And then the impact would be greater economic development of households and of women. Um, so challenges that uh, exist um, with the existing options is ICDS is a government program uh, that offers child care uh, for children in the age of zero to six years. But there are issues related to their accessibility, poor infrastructure. Um, I think the next presenter, Shraddha, will elaborate more on what exactly the problems of child care are. So I'll skip this. Um, then 
what exactly is the Balwadi program or how it is? So it is um, a small house or a center which is, is situated at a hamlet level. A hamlet will have around 50 to 100 households and uh, it's a secure place for parents to leave their children um, and we are considering the age group of one to six and the center takes care of nutrition so they provide them with one snack and one uh, lunch. Um, basically they give them a nutritious diet, they uh, provide a safe place where kids could sleep and um, also it works on early, um, early childhood education so cognitive development is another um, area that's taken care of. The supervision is done by a trained staff or attendant, we call them Sanchalika. Um, and there is standardized education curriculum and it's based on the age group. So there's an age group of one to two and then three to six and the uh, curriculum is different based on the requirements. Um, so these are the five criteria that we considered, um, uh, that we used to include um, hamlets into, the, into our study area. Um, so I can discuss this later maybe. Um, so our main question was, um, does the access of this Balwadi program or these creches or daycare centers, do they affect uh, women's economic opportunity and empowerment? And our other questions in the survey, in the detailed survey we have, they also uh, look at the impact on socioeconomic outcomes, women's mental health, uh, nutrition and health among children. And uh, we are also looking into the cost effectiveness of Balwadi program. This is a little tricky to do because um, the benefits are many and they might not always be measurable. And we are doing a clustered randomized control trial for this purpose. Um, this is a simple map and this plots where the controlled and treated hamlets are. Um, we, are we currently finished our midline and are analyzing the data. We are moving into our endline phase next year. Um, pass it on to Anusha. So these are just some findings from our baseline study that we, are, we have conducted. So these are basic findings of uh, so the average, uh, so the baseline survey was basically conducted with all mothers who have children in the age range of 1 to 6 within all the hamlets. So we have a total sample of 160 hamlets within uh, Udaipur, like, uh, which is in Rajasthan. And uh, so the average age was found to be 29.9 years and uh, the about only like um, 25 or you can say 26 respondents have ever attended school and uh, a large majority of respondents were married at a very early age and 50% uh, of our sample is below poverty line. So these are some of the children's outcomes. So uh, we found, so we've surveyed uh, all the children who were below, respondents children who were below the age of 6 and we've also taken height and weight measurements of those children. So, uh, the, so for all the children below the age of 6, only about 24% were fully immune and the stunting, wasting, and underweight measures are extremely high. So this was another study that was uh, done uh, in Rajasthan, and here the full immunization, the rate was found to be 37%, which is much higher than like what we found in our sample. And our uh, the reason, one reason is that like they consider younger uh, ch children, we've considered uh, children till the age of uh, six years, so that could be one reason for the variation. But also that the region that we are focusing on is much more underdeveloped, even within the state of Rajasthan, it's very underdeveloped and uh, poor, so it, that also contributes to this. This is just some, uh, some of the health indicators that we found. So we asked respondents like if any of their children had any of these health conditions in the past one month, so like fever, diarrhea, persistent cough and stuff, which was found to be pretty high. And uh, we are really hoping that once the Balwari or the daycare centers, which are already set so they are basically providing a nutritious meal, providing basic medicines and a healthy way of like uh, living. So we are hoping that this could come down. In terms of empowerment, I think again like uh, we are all focusing on women's empowerment and like it's a complex phenomena to uh, assess. And we are basically defining that in terms of women's empowerment, we can see it as three that we need human, social and financial capital. So we are defining human capital as basically the views that you have on like gender issues or stuff like that. And social is basically your freedom of movement, your participation in community activities, and financial is your participation in like labor market. So we're really saying that given if we have this, then it leads to like power and agency. So we're defining power as a control over resources, and agency is basically your ability to make and define choices. 
which leads to economic advancement and but it's interrelated because if you get economic advancement then you also get power and agency so it's interrelated that way so we're really hoping that this could lead to women's economic empowerment and as Parvin mentioned these are some of these could be really long term and like not visible in the next you know, year or two but uh, so uh, these are some again findings from the baseline survey. So in terms of the views, we found that 32% of women considered justified to like uh, for a husband to beat his wife in like some situations. Uh, however, ten, only 10% sample think that it is better to send a son to the school than a uh, than a daughter. So we just want to like highlight that like um, some things might be like it's very context dependent, and like some uh, some indicators of empowerment may be more important in this context than the other. Uh, for instance, like decision making, we can really see that from about 20 to 40 percent of respondents are not involved in decision making relating to like uh, whether it's healthcare about themselves or whether it's decisions to send their children to school or not. So they're not involved in those decisions at all. This is uh, just an uh, indicator of intimate partner violence. So about 60 percent respondents uh, reported some form of controlling behavior by their husbands. 32% reported facing some emotional abuse and 37% reported physical abuse in the last uh, 12 months. This is again freedom of movement. Like I mentioned, so freedom of movement seems doesn't seem to be such a big issue when you look at within village. So about say 86 to 91% of respondents are allowed to move freely within their uh, villages. Within their villages, however, this percentage drops like to 53% to 55 when we asked whether they're allowed to go outside of their villages to like different places like say market or a health center. So this could be one area where we could think that maybe this is not such a big issue in this context. But again, if we go outside of the village, it seems to be an issue. And again, only like say 88% of women uh, always vote. So that's a really high percentage. And uh, But only 12% women participate in any kind of uh, groups in the community. This is just some analysis that we have done. So we have basically seen the uh, relationship between alternative caregivers that are there in the home. So these alternative caregivers could be any family member uh, apart from the parents and children below the age of six. So we've seen that there's a positive relationship between, uh, so if as the number of caregivers increase, the alternative caregivers increase, more number of women go out to work and also more number of women go out, to, uh, go out for paid employment. This is just, uh, so we asked, uh, we had a, a question in the baseline survey on like different activities that women do in the past 24 hours and how much time they spend we found that about, uh, so only on average, only 17 minutes are spent like doing any kind of paid work, whereas about 5-45 minutes are spent doing unpaid work, which is both household as well as like uh, outside, like working on the fields and stuff. These are just, uh, so I'm going to quickly run through, I'm, I think uh, there's less time, but uh, we just want to highlight some of the, so we have all this baseline data, so what are we doing with this? So we have some ongoing, uh, so this is, these are all in draft forms and they're not yet published, but uh, we're doing this uh, paper on uh, mental health and time use. So we've analyzed like what is the relationship between mental health and time use. So uh, in terms of mental health, we've basically seen that uh, as like women spend more time doing like uh, household chores like uh, collecting water or laundry and stuff, so the, the stress scores increase. These are another three papers on, uh, maybe I can discuss this later, but uh, these are three papers that uh, one of the students, PhD students, will be presenting at the World Association of Social Psychiatry. So here we've analyzed three things, basically intimate, the relationship between intimate partner violence and women's agency, and women's agency and mental health, and intimate person, partner violence and mental health. Maybe I could discuss it later, like what the findings are. And then we have a systematic review that we've done, and we'll be presenting the same uh, this afternoon. So in terms of research uptake, uh, so we have been presenting this uh, at many conferences. We recently uh, presented at the WWGS in London, and we've presented uh, in India as well at various uh, seminars and conferences. We recently also had the advisory committee meeting where we engaged like, uh, stakeholders from like, uh, different NGOs, and we tried to get people from the government, which is a hard deal. And uh, so we're doing all of that. We uh, obviously have all these papers published. We have policy memos and we continuously have blogs and stuff. We've also come up with a video, which if um, anybody's interested, we can show it at some point. In terms of future strategies, uh, we're basically hoping that starting now itself, and we have already started, but uh, basically engaging everybody and kind of highlighting this problem at different levels. And this is a complex problem and not, which doesn't affect just one person. 
we are hoping to engage like a lot of people like policy makers, practitioners as well as like NGOs etc. And uh, one thing that came up was stakeholder mapping in our advisory committee meeting which was basically tailoring like having different outputs for like different people. So like government might want something else like but if you're looking for say scale ups we would probably want something a detailed document on what the intervention involves, what kind of training is involved in the intervention and stuff. So coming up with tailored outputs for like different stakeholders. Hello, I'm uh, Gretchen Donahauer from UC Berkeley. Um, I'm a demographer, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment on this paper. It's very humbling to me as a social statistician, sort of measuring things and saying, here's a problem, here's a problem, there's a problem. <laughs> And then to be asked to actually comment on work that people are doing on the ground to actually try to address this problem, and it sounds like an amazing uh, program. Um, so those of us in the population research community, uh, members of the International Union of Scientific Study Population, uh, get these occasional pieces, sort of provocative think pieces, and there was one early this year by Alaka uh, Basu, a distinguished Indian demographer saying that she hears constantly from her American colleagues that it's such a misery to try to combine work and family responsibilities and it causes all of this stress and all of these terrible outcomes. And yet here at the same time this message is Indian women aren't working enough. <laughs> you know, they're taking care of their families and why aren't they working? They should be working so that we can all be miserable together, I guess. Is the idea. <laughs> um, and but then, of course, this sort of rejoinder to that is there's one thing about making a free choice to maximize your own welfare versus choosing the best of the worst options because there are all these constraints. And so I think that the program that you have, especially adding the nutrition and peace, also takes care, is working on a multidimensional level. It's not just that you have to take care of your children, but you also have to feed them, and that takes time. And so thinking about the barriers in a more complex way, um, if it's possible at this point to gather more information about sort of more dimensions of the barrier, um, then I think that might be good and that you can then, uh, when you get to your outcome measurements, slice and dice things by more way to understand those dimensions. Things like, so childcare is something that you can do at home combined with all the other stuff you have to do, the laundry and the and so it, it, you, it's great that you have that time use data and to then look at that afterwards. And while the childcare barrier might work on one level, then is it not helping at all with all of that other housework that uh, women are stuck with? Or are they able to use some of their earnings to, uh, to then marketize some of that stuff? Food, um, get help to do laundry, things like that. Um, and then there's the other barrier that is about uh, community and other people's opinions. I mean, do people whose husbands are not supported or whose communities are not supportive at all uh, have different outcomes than uh, those uh, in a different situation? Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess that was, uh, that, those were my main points about sort of trying to get more dimensions of barrier beyond just childcare. And then uh, the Sanchalikas um, in the program, I wasn't sure whether those people were trained as part of the program or whether they already existing had skills that they had acquired and you hired them. Because just, they also, it, to my mind, represented an interesting point of study. But uh, yeah, so, but really it's, I
government is after this one. Um, um, but just um, coming back to that point, I sort of felt that um, in, in the beginning you talked about the inadequacies of the current state, but in my opinion, how um, your study will address some of those inadequacies. So for example, when you say that um, the existing program only features one aspect of it, how is it that your study will address that particular um, um, Then um, I think just uh, for the reader, Then, um, looking at the baseline data, uh, it seems that although only 60% of women have to work in certain ways, over 90% have worked in the last So that got me thinking if there is a commonality um, to women's and how might that affect um, the, the time we do surveys. Um, and then uh, I was just curious. Also, in terms of quantitative evaluation, um, there's a requirement that every about one in three women and three in one in five that they do And then, um, how does the monthly pay contribution compare to um, what the government is paying for the position? Um, so that one of the challenges is that um, underpayment is. And then I just wanted to comment on that, um, the time diagram, where you show that women only spend 17% of the pay rate, um, which I think is also a comparison to the rest of the But I think it would be useful to put that in the data. I asked you whether women are working versus not working. Some people were not hearing the mic, so when you do speak, speak to the mic for the live stream, yes. So I will take a few questions as the last one, and sorry to rush everybody. So there's a question there. So just coming to that seasonal point, um, my understanding from work I've done in Rajasthan is the, there's quite a lot of, um, so this is, it's like a centimeter from my mouth, so it may not be working. Um, I was asking about how this interacted with migration. I, my understanding is quite a lot of the men in this area are migrating to the cities, and how do you think that interacts with the women's role? Hi. Uh, can anyone, everyone hear me? Uh, my question is, uh, um, from the map which you showed us uh, of your treatment and non-treatment areas, they seem to lay close to each other. 
So I was wondering how you're tackling the problem of contamination there. And the second question is uh, with the problem of attrition. Uh, it doesn't mean that opening Barwadi's, uh, the children would be sent to the schools on a regular basis. And uh, the third question is in terms of your income distribution of your respondents where 50% is below poverty line. Right? I was wondering what the distribution was like between the, uh, the, the, uh, those under the treatment areas and the non-treatment areas because that may have a, a huge impact on your final outcome this is as well. Just to uh, start with your question, uh, in terms of so this is an RCT, so like uh, so yeah, on the map maybe they look closer, and uh, the terrain of Udaipur is kind of very hilly and uh, not very accessible. So the control and treatment are actually not uh, very close. Are I mean the interventions there has been there for one, one month, month, and there's, there's no, no contamination, contamination in terms, terms of uh, like, like people, people from control coming to the thing, treatment areas. areas. And um, in, in terms, terms of, uh, so, yeah, so yeah, so this, this was, was the baseline, baseline survey which was done uh, before we actually, actually randomly assigned control and treatment. treatment. So, so maybe in the, the midline, midline we could show like what, what is the, in terms, terms of poverty and uh, all other indicators, how, how it's different, different between treatment and control. And, and uh, uh, in, in terms, terms of, um, I think we don't have that table, but we did even for the baseline, like we did do an analysis of like the different things just to show that it's the same across like different uh, attributes like say the average age of the respondent or the income and level and so they, they were found to be pretty much equal in the baseline phase but uh, let's see how in, in the midline like whether that, that the intervention change. changes or to, like changes anything on that end. So uh, and, and I think the point on, on um, I think there are lots of <laughs> questions we will try to answer. So, so one was on Sanchalika. So this is so Sanchalika is a woman from the community uh, higher and uh, they so the uh, Seva Mandir, which is the our partner, partner organization for this uh, implementing this intervention. So they train the Sanchalika to run, run this bar and how uh, children have to be dealt with and stuff. So, uh, so, so it's, it's not, not somebody who's already, already trained, but this is something that they do. So that, that could, uh, so as you mentioned, like, yes, that is also an interesting feature, and that, that is also part, part of uh, a part, part of empowerment, and like they are empowering one more woman as well. And uh, so uh, the, the other question, question was on why, um, so how, how the problems of the ICDS, how our intervention is addressing the problems, is because the government programs are already in existence. So, so one is the issue on accessibility. So most of the uh, young Nivalis which are in the ICDS program are at the village level. However, ours are at the hamlet level. So hamlets are unofficial things that people have come up with. But they, so since it's at the hamlet level, it's more accessible to people. And uh, in, in terms, terms of the timings as well, uh, so there is, um, so, so we can talk, talk more on how each of these things are addressed, but uh, the Angdwali, as in, in terms of center base, it runs, runs only for four hours, hours whereas the Balwali runs for seven hours, which is more in uh, connect, you know, connection with the working hours of uh, parents. And, and there, there are a number, number of other things which probably we can discuss later. later. And um, in terms of seasonality, yes, there is at least seasonality of uh, work. And uh, the 90% that uh, you mentioned was uh, basically women. So the 90% is women who also work in their own fields. So it is not paid work. So uh, paid work was very less. It was less than 10% of women who were engaged in paid work. So, uh, but yeah, almost like 95% are engaged in some form of work, which, in, which primarily includes work in their own field, which is again unpaid work. Um, so, so on, on the barriers, barriers bit, um, you raised a very uh, interesting point because barrier, barrier cannot, cannot be just one or two. two. There, there are a lot, lot of things that uh, come into play there. there. So we, we are just trying, trying to see, see given that, that it's a randomized control trial, we are seeing if a child care facility is trying to address, you know, like, like uh, it, it is seen as one, one of the barriers, barriers in, in multiple research that has been, been done. done. So trying, trying to see to what extent this, if we cover this gap, to what extent it helps in employment indicators. Um, sustainability, great question. We are still struggling, as I said, that you know, cost effectiveness is, a, is an important uh, measure and we are trying to see how to actually analyze it because the, some of the posts they, or the benefits cannot be measured in terms of uh, monetary outcomes. So we will have to see how to figure that out. But sustainability definitely is a, um, is a thing we are working on. Um, we did balance checks before we did uh, randomization, so that takes care of 
um, people, people being equally, uh, the economic status, status is uh, same in terms of vote treatment and control in Hamlet, so there is not a problem there. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but we we'll definitely work on the missing gaps because, because we, we have, have answers, answers. It's, it's not written, written down, but, but we could put that together. I think it will then be a complete story. Pleasure to be here today. Um, we're really pleased to be part of um, the core set of projects that takes the care economy seriously. And um, so, me and Jennifer will kind of share the. We're going to do this in tandem, so we'll hear from both of us. Um, so, yeah, we have uh, the three institutions involved in this project Institute of Development Studies, ISST in New Delhi, and um, RAC RU, in, uh, which is looking at Rwanda and Tanzania. So just, just to give you a bit of background, I mean, this is important for us to understand that women's economic empowerment programs, if they do not take unpaid care work seriously, I mean, can we really talk about women's economic empowerment without taking the care economy seriously is one of our fundamental uh, premises. So one of the things that, many things that we already know, regardless of share of household income women earn, and women's increasing entry into paid work, Evidence indicates that women do most unpaid care giving in all contexts. And we have a recent study by ODI, which is looking at uh, 100 plus countries, which is saying that actually women sh have too much of the burden of unpaid care work that they do it across countries. Of course, variations across countries, but definitely across countries, this is the case. Um, and then there's this persistence of a gender disadvantage for women in the economy. What it does is that it pushes poor women into flexible, low skilled, and low paid informal work that they have to take on in order to accommodate their care responsibilities. So, what if there are women's economic empowerment programs that do not address uh, women's unpaid care work? It's, this is one of our hypotheses that the low income women in the paid labor market may not also be able to adequately substitute for their care responsibilities. And, and this, this has consequences for the care and human development outcomes of both women and those being cared for. Again, women and girls' income from paid work may be eroded by the need for substitute care, which defeats the very purpose of women's economic empowerment. Conversely, of course, the fact that women actually have such an unequal burden of unpaid care work erodes their ability to seek employment and income, thereby increasing the risk of economic disempowerment. So, these are some of the things that form the backdrop to our research and what the aim of the research really is to create knowledge about how women's economic empowerment policy and programming can generate a double boon. And this is a key concept in our research as opposed to a double burden. Because we believe that if women's economic empowerment programs take seriously unpaid care work that the women do, what it has to do is account for um, that the type of paid work that they do, so conditions of work remain important so that they're not doing like low paid, low skilled uh, work. So that's really also a component of the double room that we see. We also see it as, I mean, we have a theory of change which accounts for what we mean by the double room. What it is is that, you know, care work, um, women's economic empowerment programming ought to optimize, and this is about the carer, women's economic participation by enabling them to work without deepening their time poverty, or them worrying about the amount and quality of care their families are receiving. 
So we believe that if this is done, then it will enable women to choose better paid work and more empowering types of work rather than, you know, just home-based work or, you know, low-skill work. Um, and it means that, you know, they have access to work and the conditions of work also ought to be good. This is what we mean by optimization for women's economic empowerment about the care. But we also think it's important to share the gains of women's economic empowerment across generations of women. So we already know that when women go out to work, sibling care, other women take on the unpaid care burdens. And we do not want women's economic empowerment to just empower the one woman who's going out to work. It has to be shared across generations so that other girls and women in the household are not impacted by women's uh, entry into the paid economy. Um, and we think also that, you know, the care work that women are performing ought to be sustained. So if we are sending somebody to a daycare, the quality of the daycare becomes important. So when we're redistributing care work, what is the kind of care that is um, that women are then I mean, I mean, what, what children and whoever else is being cared for is able to access. Um, so, so yeah, we, we want childcare arrangements to not de deteriorate, but rather improve. So our project plan is also, I mean, we wanted to actually map the social organization of care within low-income households in India, Nepal, Tanzania, and Rwanda. These are four countries that we're looking at. And now, our entry point into this, I mean, we could have done, which, uh, uh, which we did think of initially, we could have actually looked at something like the ICDS program, which um, is a large government program that caters, to, as you heard from the previous speakers. It's a large, it actually provides some form of childcare. So we could have thought about examining that kind of project in order to see whether that is empowering for women and enables them to enter employment in empowering ways. But, but what we really wanted to focus on was women's economic empowerment program itself. So we then actually, we then uh, looked at programs that have a component of women's economic empowerment. So instead of going at it from the child care and the care economy, we were looking at it from the women's economic empowerment program and seeing how that accounts for our unpaid care work. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are interested in focusing on both state and non-state programs. So all of our countries have one state program and one non-state program. We're thinking of, you know, Diane Nelson's uh, categorization of like, re recognition, reduce, uh, reduction and redistribution. So that does inform how we're thinking about what we programs can do. Then we want to derive recommendations. So I'm going to move on quickly because we have very little time. Uh, a large research question is, on women's economic empowerment policies and programs, how do they take women's, um, how can they and whether they do take account of women's care work? Two mapping questions, the first two are mapping questions and the third is a solution-oriented question. We want to understand uh, how women in low-income households actually manage. How are they managing both their paid work and unpaid care work um, responsibilities? And then, and then we want to look at the women's economic empowerment programs itself and see whether they take economic care tasks into account. And then we have the solutions oriented question methods. Our study used to mixed methods uh, where we used uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, methods and also informative interviews. And we also used tools from Perspectory uh, Toolkit. And in the quantitative surveys, we talked to 50 women from the different programs that Shreda has presented. And also, 
and with the quantitative methods, we, we went into the households to do the case studies, and also do participatory exercises with the children, uh, spouses, and adolescents uh, of those ages that we are showing here, 2010 and 19. So we have a total of 16 case studies per program and 32 per country. And in the tools that we use to be participatory tools, we have nine tools which talk about the activity mapping, for example, the body, um, the care body map and other instruments that we use to and to make it very participatory for the people to understand and be able to tell us uh, the responses that of the questions that we are raising. Um, so, in the methods that we use, like I say, uh, that's a the quantitative study, I mean, the quantitative tool that we used, which is a questionnaire that had issues that we, we raised on, um, on, the, on um, like household roster, time mapping, and these are the modules that we are looking at, decision making, paid work, um, and economic empowerment participation, sharing care, interactions between paid work, um, and, and um, this was mainly from the questionnaire. The, the qualitative modules that we are looking at were social demographic characteristics and sharing of care, and this was from the households and the mothers who are telling us about what the experiences and their perceptions are about women's children and unpaid care work. So this integrated nature of the methods was used from the beginning, and each of the situations that was being addressed had various tools that we used to address these issues. And this is how we did it. We look at the, 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 the different objectives uh, of, the, of the study that we were looking at, and we wanted to see which method can work for what, and then the modules that were being covered within these questions. I mean, I mean, the thing, thing to say about, about methods, methods is really we wanted to integrate it from, from the start. So we've had all these components and each of them from the start, it was not like one method was looking at one question. We tried to integrate them from the start, you know. Um, and, and then, of course, course the programs we're looking at, uh, we're looking at the uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act and the Self-Employed Women's Association programs, which is one government program and another non-government program in India. In Nepal, Nepal, we're looking at the Kanali Employment Program, which is actually modeled on Narega, uh, which only is limited to the Kanali zone and to the Midwestern region of Nepal, and Oxfam's, uh, Oxfam Nepal's in Enterprise Development Program. Um, in terms of the sites, I'm really going to move on, but we can talk about the detail of the sites. We chose the sites based on high women's participation rate in Rajasthan, for instance, in Narega, Seva, because of, you know, uh, we wanted an urban program, and Seva is working in Indore and Ujjain and, Raj and um, MP. Um, in KB, we were limited. I mean, there's only one uh, it's a small zone in which KB is operationalized. Uh, and even that, we actually chose the sites where the Karnali Employment Program technical assistance team is working on. So we chose it uh, based on various criteria. Our, our primary respondents are paid women, women respondents in paid work, both participants and non-participants. So all women that we're interviewing are in paid work. Um, the field of study in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, like she says, we had two programs from each country, which were state and non-state. And in Rwanda, we had what we visited, what is called the Division 2020 Umrege program. And action aid program as a state. And in Tanzania, we visited the Women Involvement Fund, which is by the government, and then Oxfam um, in Tanzania. Two so sites in each of these programs were selected. Under Tanzania um, Women Involvement Fund, we visited Korogui and short, short districts in, in Tanzania. And Oxfam, we went to Bungu and Korogui districts and Oshoto. And in Rwanda, we visited in Isimbi and Mishambu in Uye district, and then Action Aid we went to Moko district uh, and in Mosanze. Uh, Many were respondents in, in this and they, they were non participants actually, as we said. So, I mean, because of a positive time, I'm going to try and skip the detail of the program because we just wanted to give you some preliminary findings. Just to say that there are two types of programs that we've examined. One, 
like Narega actually provides employment. Others such as Seva and Oxfam Nepal are enabling employment programs. So they're not actually providing uh, work to anybody, but they're providing kind of um, an enabling environment. They're providing skills training, they're talking about um, consciousness raising, they form groups. So there's a whole bunch of things that they do that are not necessarily providing women employment at the end of it. Um, so, and, and I think, think th those will have different, um, um, I mean, they, these, will, these different programs will come out with different kinds of, uh, I think, recommendations for how women's economic empowerment is actually possible. So I'm going to kind of skip the detail of the program because we have no time at all, if that's okay. Just to get to very preliminary findings, we're actually only starting on our analysis now. So this is this probably will change by the course of the project. But very preliminary findings are that, of course, unpaid care work we're finding in terms of our mapping work. So this, this findings are really from impressions from the field and having a quick look at the surveys. We haven't yet analyzed the time use component of our surveys, which we think would provide really interesting information. But largely, unpaid care, care work is women's responsibility, and we'd like to state that emphatically again, again and again. Um, men step in only when women are very sick, and when women are totally unable to do the work, and when girls, children, and women are absent. Um, some of the tasks, as we know, I mean, but to reiterate, the, some of the tasks that women are particularly burdened by are, 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 are unpaid productive tasks, such as cutting grass, fetching firewood, I mean, one of the things in Nepal, for instance, it's a hilly region, and I mean, one of our findings is that women get uterine prolapse because of the heavy loads that they're carrying up the hill. So the consequences of some of these arduous activities are quite heavy. Um, again, cultural norms, and we can talk more about that, the cultural norms in relation to who ought to be doing this kind of heavy work. Um, of course, there were instances of reallocation of work to other women in the household and instances of sibling care as well. But what we found, and this is really interesting, I mean, we talk about time poverty. For us, there is something else also to talk about in terms of time stretching. And that is that actually it's not that women are dropping work because of their over, because of their double burdens. What they're doing is they're getting up early in the morning and finding time for it. So we think there is something that is not just about time poverty, not having time to do it. It's finding the time to do it. And they find it. And they find it. And then we're interested in the kind of consequences this has for both uh, themselves, the deplete, the, their own depletion and the well-being, and uh, of course for the kind of care that is being provided. And this comes up again and again in all of our sites, which is that the poor provision of our basic services increases, very proportionally increases the women's unpaid care burdens and is uh, largely associated with such work. Everything, I mean, um, whether it be irrigation, water, fuel, these are really important public resources that exacerbate women's time poverty and um, Uh, so, so I'm, I'm going to move, it's really about access to public resources because I've run out of time, we've run out of time, so if, if maybe we can address some of this in the questions, but uh, public resources, um, then again we're talking about seasonality, we have found that seasonal variations in intensity of women's burden, there is, there is a connection between seasonality and time poverty. Um, we've got, I'm going to skip to uh, talking about some of the effects on women's double burdens on children's well-being. We have found, for instance, women, of course, were taking kids along with them to work sites, left alone at home. Um, some instances of women actually locking their children and um, tying them to a table or whatever because they're not able they have to go out to work. And of course, in terms of consequences for children, and this is different, different kinds of consequences across uh, countries, but School dropouts in India, for sure, we found a lot of school dropouts. In Nepal, not so much. But uh, the, the, those were some of the consequences for children's well-being. And of course, children themselves taking on um, child uh, work in the absence of their mothers. Um, sorry, I'm going to just wait for questions to come because yeah, we're out of time.
Okay. okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so thanks, uh, uh, Shraddha and uh, Jennifer, Jennifer for that, that presentation. presentation. I have heard, heard it once earlier, earlier, and therefore my comprehension of the work, work is better. I would say the time constraint uh, uh, was, was much more here, perhaps. Um, uh, what, what I feel, I feel that, that yes, it's definitely very important area of work, work and, and also our research. Um, has tried, tried to un, uh, um, address, address the complexity of, of the whole issue. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a positive point. point. But, but that also becomes challenging. So, so some of the comments that I uh, would be making is more for future. Perhaps, perhaps you've already, already thought, thought about, about it. it. If not, perhaps it does deserve that, that kind of attention. Which is this that you're uh, doing both state, non-state. And I think what is more important in your research, the link between uh, Unpaid work and paid work, I think uh, it's, it's, it's always, always good to have more uh, greater understanding, deeper understanding, but we also have literature that uh, helps us understand. But I think what is perhaps much more important is that how uh, one can address and whether these programs are addressing and what are the different ways, not necessarily one way. And there it, it becomes interesting. You have four countries and then you have four, like, State, state and non-state that, that itself uh, makes it, you know, eight, eight contexts. And uh, and if you uh, really go deeper into uh, policies, economic, social, if you go into uh, historical uh, uh, norms as well and progression as well, uh, all this makes it very complex. And uh, uh, but, but I think it makes sense to do that because your study is quantitatively it's a small study. So in terms of Quantitative results, it will always be questionable on various grounds. It makes sense to go deeper into those issues, and if you can cover these eight dimensions on one side, state, non-state, and uh, uh, whole issues of how you know different kinds of things, like one, one can talk of economic, uh, social, and historical, but within that, how uh, different uh, opportunities, for example. Heard in this morning about sectoral, sectoral and occupational. If you find that writing and, and, and see how that actually makes a difference. And, and then, um, for example, I'm familiar with Seva and uh, that Nareka. Now, the kind of opportunities Nareka brings and the kind of uh, enabling environment Seva creates are very different. But uh, uh, also, I am not uh, uh, clear how will you differentiate because Seva areas will also have. Urban, so Nerega will not. Then there are other schemes that are operating there. Suppose you have good ICDS centers operating there, whether that helps. So there are other public services which will also be available there and or absent there, and how that impacts. So all that, if you go deeper, perhaps you can have a framework where you can, you know, you can actually make a web and you can analyze and link. So that would be helpful in terms of uh, policy uh, information. Um, but I think two things that you brought, one is commons. That's something most researchers these days do not look at, you know, the, the shrinking commons. Does that affect women's uh, 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 lives in terms of both care and unpaid care work? And uh, uh, second is drudgery, whether it reduces drudgery or not. You know, it's, it's one thing to have a combination of care and unpaid care work, as had someone said. It's another, another thing, thing to, uh, you know, that to be drudgerous, which impacts your Appreciate it. 
noted your emphasis on, on the provision of public services, uh, of basic, basic services. That again is not emphasized. I mean, if you look at Singapore, Sing Singapore made it an objective of their transport policy to provide safe, safe employment, employment for women. Uh, so, so uh, I don't think that kind of emphasis has been made in, in other, other countries. countries. So, so, so it is good that you are highlight yeah, highlighting that. that. Uh, what, what I can contribute here is really more in terms of adding a little bit to what Jyotishna said. Uh, this, this distinction between very poor women and women who are not so poor. Uh, very poor women, regardless of impact on children or, or anybody else, they are forced out to work. And usually they are married to men who are also doing very, very uh, low paid, Actually, exhausting kind of work. Uh, whereas, if you look at the slightly better off, who may be a little bit better educated, now they, I think, face a different kind of choice. They can work, but they are not going to be able to earn enough to get a pension or savings or whatever. So, for them, it may make sense to invest in their children. So there, there may be a kind of rational choice going on uh, for that start of women. And I don't think that that has been uh, taken into account much in the literature. In fact, I think that theoretically, there, there is a lot more we can, as economists, extract from the collective bargaining models kind of literature. And, 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 and I know that that has been applied to developed countries, but not to developing countries. And I think Theoretically, I think the time is right, right to really explore that, that literature and see how, how uh, uh, what, what insights we can get from that. that. Because when you are talking about women's participation, the, the, the theories that, that are currently are applied are what was, were developed in developing countries after the Second World War. Whereas the situation you get in developing countries is like, like, the, like, like the Victorian England, England you know, where are middle class of education, either became a governess or, you know, look for a man, man to marry. marry. Uh, so, so, so marriage is a livelihood uh, as, as well. well. And, and I, I think, think we need to take a broader view of, of, uh, of, of the, the whole idea of women's participation, participation and, 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 and expand the theories uh, that, that we use to explain it. Thank you so much um, for these issues you have raised, and I think they are very good um, contributions to what we are going to do. Um, but just to mention that, like we said, we are still here at the, at the beginning of having all our data compiled, and these are some of the things that we shall definitely look at, and they are very interesting. Um, and the literature, we shall also add on, um, on what we have already. And I think you are right when to talk about the distinction between the very poor women and then those that have some kind of level of education. I think that's a very good um, area that we shall look at. Though most of the women that we really talked to are from rural areas, we really went to rural. Um, and if you were in urban areas, that we would try to see whether we can actually easily get this distinction. But it's a very good point. I mean, we are largely looking at low-income women. So, you know, I mean, our, our data is talking about the drudgery and all that is associated with having two people at a very low income trying to struggle and survive. So that, that is the context of our research. Um, thank you, I mean, thank you for all the comments. In terms of the complexity of the research, we totally get it. I mean, we're looking at eight programs. Uh, it's no joke. Um, but, but honestly, what we think there are things that I these programs together. together. Some, some of them are kind of providing direct, direct employment. Some, some of them are creating enabling environments. And, and you know, I think that that, that kind of distinction might be useful. Is it? I 
I mean, Pop, you're going to talk about it when you do, is providing an enabling environment the way to go uh, in terms of thinking about, but then, of course, Narega, uh, it has transformed women's lives in terms of actually giving uh, access to women, many of them for the first time. Um, so th there are key components of these programs that we think we can exploit. But of course, we know that the Narega's, the centers, the crash centers that they're supposed to run are not operational. So, so even though there is intent in the policy, there is no provision, so there are so So we want to have program targeted recommendations. So for each program, I think we might have valuable things coming out. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's our plan. You know? And um, about, about the shrinking commons, I mean, yeah, that is really important. And I think it is related to public resources. We have done a public resource map as one of our uh, tools that we use. So we do get a picture of who has access to what, how far the Anwari is, where the hospital is, what roads exist, which communities are able to access that. So part of our research is about capturing some of these, um, you know, deforestation, all of that. How does that impact? Um, I mean, women's tragedy, uh, and, and actually, I mean, we didn't get a chance enough to say this, but the psychological effects on women are incredible. I mean, many of the things that are coming out from the field are about terms such as hakan, dukhi, dikha, all of these phrases that talk about depletion of emotional resources, of uh, time, of you know, women's resources are are at stake here in a sense, and um, yeah. yeah psychological well-being is very much so the, 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 the thing that we're talking about in terms of a bubble boom is actually trying to um, address some of these concerns we it is about emotional well-being it is about saying okay i should feel comfortable sending my child out because i know the care she or he is receiving is good it is about saying actually the conditions of work where i do go to work are good so all of these for us form a combination that is what women's economic empowerment is about.